everybody welcome back to esoteric atlanta i am joined today by my friend jessica jones the cryptic huntress how you doing today jessica hey bryce i'm doing excellent how are you thanks for I'm having me so good i'm so, it's been a while it's been so crazy i'm so excited to have you back to talk about what we're going to talk about today you guys make sure if you're not subscribed Make sure that you are subscribed to the Cryptic Huntress on YouTube. You're close to 10,000 subscribers, girl. And um, you guys, Jessica and I were just talking about this off camera. Make sure that you um, are still subscribed to our channels because we've both been dealing with the same issues on this platform that are out of our control. I will just leave it at that. So I will put all of Jessica's links down in the description box below. And um, yeah, you guys, let me stop share quickly. Now, I had Jessica. I love that I have a remote viewer friend where I could just text you and be like, I need you to look at something for me. Because <laughs> I discovered this case when I was traveling. I heard it on a podcast. Whoops. Let me um, actually hold on one second here. I'm going to pull up the brief little uh, video I did on it a few weeks ago because this case was so fascinating to me, so wild. I cannot believe I'd never heard of it before. And this was the Granger Taylor case. So it's this one right here. Um, so I'll link that down in the description box below if you guys missed that one or are not familiar with the Granger Taylor case. And as this works, Jessica, you didn't know what you were remote viewing when I sent you the coordinates, did you? No, absolutely not. I, I got a, a set of coordinates. You sent me eight numbers and that's all I had because I do something called coordinate remote viewing where I'm given a set of coordinates, which are just some random numbers that are assigned to a target. So you had this, the I guess, the disappearance of Granger as the target uh, and the circumstances surrounding it. So that's but I didn't know that I just had those numbers and I got a lot of really cool data on this one. You sent me, as you often do, after she remote views it, she'll send me pictures of her notes. And she'll be like, does this make any sense to you? And I was like, girl, where do I start? And so I sent you a link to a podcast. So just briefly, guys, um, again, you can, for details, you can go and watch the episode again. But just before we get into you, your, your daughter, uh, Granger Taylor went missing on November 29th. 1980 from Vancouver Island up in the Pacific Northwest of Canada. Very small town. He lived in called Duncan, which is a logging fishing city, very working class. As of 2021, the census was only about 5,000 people. So very small town. And he was kind of this like savant. He was very smart. He left school in the eighth grade, but he made kind of a name for himself of being this like genius mechanic where he could just like bring life back into old you know railroads he, he got really obsessed with um with uh, extraterrestrials and in 19 around 1980 ish he started to think that these extraterrestrials were telepathically talking to him and that he was going to be picked up for a 42 month gallivant around the galaxies which is 150 years for us on earth and he did disappear on the day he told his friends they were picking him up uh the uh, police up in Canada believe they found his remains. Uh, we'll talk about it, but that's kind of the brief overview. So I'm going to pass this over to you, Jessica, and let you kind of talk about your findings before you knew anything of what was going on with this case. Okay, so the first thing I asked you was, Bryce, was this a missing person? <laughs> because that was the entire um, session of my remote viewing. This session was... Uh, Obviously, to me, it looked as though there was a missing person. Okay, and uh, <laughs> okay, so let's just let's just start with some of the sensory data. Okay, so so what I do, I'll, I'll explain to your audience who, for anyone who's not familiar with remote viewing. Okay, so remote viewing is something that our governments use. Uh, the type of remote viewing that I do is called coordinate remote viewing. Now, remote viewing is a scientific way to psychically locate a target. Okay, or locate a target that's blind, you don't know what it is, using your psychic faculties, basically, uh, after being given a set of nor numbers or coordinates. And uh, and like I said, the, the government's using our military was using remote viewing back during the Cold War, still uses it today. I, I speak to 
the soldiers uh, occasionally who tell me they they have a remote viewer assigned to their unit when they're overseas and stuff. So um, especially the snipers, and things like that. So we do we do use that. I think governments and militaries all over the world have used it. Um, I'm trained in different modes of remote viewing. And it's something that I've been doing for a long time. And I love it. It's my favorite hobby. OK, so I taught you, Bryce, how to uh, task me with a target. And, uh, and so you gave me the numbers. I, I got 78786247, I believe, were the numbers. And that's all I had. And so when I went into the session, um, what I do is I sit down with a pen and a bunch of paper, a bunch of pens and a bunch of paper, and uh, just printer paper. And I draw out some charts, and I have stages. Stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, stage five. You can go to six, whatever, um, or seven. I mean, <laughs> there's a lot of stages you can go to. And we do something called ideograms uh, where you kind of like you're, you sit down, you get your mind straight and you put your, your coordinates on the paper and then you draw some ideograms and then the aperture opens and all this information floods in from the matrix basically. Okay. So I, I pick up on a lot of sensory data. That's what we're going for. Sensory data. Anything that I, I taste, sense, see, touch, feel, whatever are right here. And so some of my sensory data on this target was um okay so I, I wrote rolling waiting or waiting fast flighty uh, i was picking up on something feminine okay so something feminine broken loving wounded and missing i actually wrote down missing okay and uh and so my analytic overlay this is just some of the key things that i was seeing <clears throat> but it, it's the, it, I was trying, I was like analyzing what my sensory data was basically is what this is. Okay. So I wrote a uh, mobile and I wrote vehicle. So I was definitely, there was definitely a vehicle involved. I wrote vessel, fast forward, fast movement, uprising, rebel soul in a rebel. Uh, I wrote down uh, going with the flow. I picked up on a heartbreak, somebody that was having a heartbreak, uh, a heavy heart, and then I picked up on a feminine energy in the environment. I said feminine. And so I wrote down, uh, I wrote down, uh, I wrote down a young woman or a woman, but I, I kept hearing there's lots of love to give, lots of love to give. And then I wrote down missing person, missing person. And, and for my stage three drawing, I wrote down a mile marker on a highway. Okay. And it had a number nine in it. And I could not get it out of my head. There's number nine in this mile marker. Uh, 919, 908, or 9, nine something. Um, and I actually, yeah, I actually drew that for my stage three drawing right there. Okay. Um, but I also, yeah, I guess, I guess that's it for the first three stages. Uh, I was very much picking up on like a rebel soul who had gone missing. Okay. And, uh, but it was kind of going with the flow. And I, I was picking up on something to do with a broken heart, or there was some, something to do with like a heavy heart in this person. So, yeah, do you want to do you want to give me some feedback on that before we move on? Yes, let me switch it here. I was actually going to suggest that because there is a lot here because I know some of the other okay. stuff you got. So vehicle. We know that Granger Taylor was very kind of eccentric. I speculate that he might have had Asperger's or been on the spectrum because he was very much a savant. Um, he was very highly intelligent. Like I said, he could bring anything mechanical back to life. And let me just, for you guys, let me just pull some pictures up. So I think sometimes it helps to have a face with a name. Granger Taylor, If if he, he was also known to always tell the truth. So this is Granger right here. And if we know anything about people on the spectrum, they always tell the truth, right? Even... They don't know how to lie at all. So that was always the big thing. Now, Granger, um, well, I think it was 32 when he went missing. He even built his own spaceship. And he was interested in how spaceships worked. That's why he built his own spaceship where he would spend a lot of time. This is when he believed the extraterrestrials were contacting him. Now, with the vehicle, this guy, Robert, was a teenager who worked with Granger and he helped Granger paint his truck like a Pepto-Bismol pink color is the description that Robert uses and we do know that Granger Taylor drove away like the last anybody saw 
Gr Granger drive away was 6 p.m. on November 28th, 1980 in his pink truck. Now that does come into back into the story when the RCMP um, believe our, our RM, what is it? The Royal Mounted, what are they called? The RCMP, yeah, like the, the three letter agency of Canada, when they allegedly found remains of Granger's truck at a particular mountain in, in, um, in the area on on Mount uh, Prevo, that's on Vancouver Island. Now there is speculation on whether that was actually Granger's truck or not. So the vehicle does make sense that he drove away in the vehicle. Now heartbreak and feminine. So you see this dog he's got in his hands, right here, mm -hmm. right here. This is his dog, Lady, and this breaks my heart. He loved that dog so much. Lady was his the love of his life. As far as I know, nobody was dating Granger. If you know anything about some some forms of, of autism or Asperger's, that makes sense that there was not a whole, didn't seem to be a whole lot of romantic interest, but he loved Lady so much. And he actually left provisions for Lady. I mean, he was a very wealthy guy. He made a lot of money creating his machines. Um, and so I, I can't, he knew he would never see Lady again. Because he was going to be away for 150 years Earth time, which is 42 months in the galactic time. So I got two hits when you said feminine heartbreak. Lady, the dog, which anybody who's a dog owner probably understands that. And his mother, his, Granger's mother. So he still lived with his parents. Um, here's the letter that he left his parents on the night that he disappeared. Dear mother and father, I have gone away to walk a abroad an alien spaceship sorry let me get my glasses <laughs> i'm gonna show my age here in a minute i can't see that y'all it's too small <laughs> let me get my glasses here um all right much better i have gone to wake a, to walk abroad an alien spaceship as reoccurring dreams assured a 42 month interstellar voyage to explore the vast universe then return i am leaving behind all of my possessions to you as i will no longer as i no longer will require the use of any please use the instructions in my will as a guide to help love granger so this is the le letter that he left on his parents door to their bedroom when he left his mother however was away in hawaii when he left so she never had a chance to say goodbye to him now with robert the kid who was a kid back then, Robert as a grown ass man now still believes that Granger is away from what I understand on the spaceship because he really wanted to go with Granger on this trip. And Granger explained to him that he can't come because there was too much life left here on earth for Granger. I mean, for Robert, excuse me, like getting married, having children. So I took that to mean that Granger did not see himself as somebody that was going to get married, going to have children, but he saw this young boy had an opportunity at really living life here on earth. And he told Robert, when I come back, I will come and visit you. And Robert knew that meant he would come and visit his grave when he came back. And after 42 months had passed, people in the town did believe Granger was up on a spaceship because he never lied. He never hid, not, he had no reason to lie. You know, um, Robert was the one that was like, you guys know it's not 42 months Earth time. It's 42 months galactic. We're not going to be here when he returns. So anyway, do you want to, does that make sense to you, Jessica? Yeah, totally. Yeah, it does. Uh, it's really, it's kind of sad. You know, we love our dogs. You know, I couldn't imagine leaving my dog. Or, well, I also have a kid too. Like I couldn't, yeah. I couldn't, well, whatever he did. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it, it, that makes a lot of sense. It does. Yeah. Uh, now, now there's some more. Okay. So in my, my stage four data, uh, some things that you mentioned already are in my data. And like, in a, a, like let, you, you said something about his truck being Pepto Bismol pink, right? I picked up on a bright pink color uh, in my data, actually. So, well, the first, the first bit of information, the first bit of data I got for my stage four um, remote viewing part of the session, I was picking up on something that was very strict. Now, to me, I was interpreting that what I was sensing is like a religion, but it was something very strict. Like he was very dedicated to whatever this was. So I wrote down religion 
And in my, and, you know, with the AOL, I was writing down like Mormon, Catholic, Baptist. Like I wrote down all of that because I was like, there's something, I, I couldn't put my finger on it, but there was something that was super, he was super, whatever I was remote viewing, it was very super strict and whatever this was. Okay. And then I was picking up on some bright colors. And the first color I wrote down was bright pink. <laughs> Okay, uh, so, but I was writing down, I was I was sensing like, um, like the colors from like the 1980s and the 1990s. I actually wrote down, I actually wrote that down. And uh, from like pink, green, blues, and yellows, something super, and I actually wrote down in living color. That's a movie, like that show from the 1990s, you know, because there was so much color, a lot of brightness, a lot of bright colors were in here. Uh, I also wrote down acid washed. <laughs> okay, so acid washed is in my data. Um. Okay, but then um, then it started to get a little more ominous in the data because I, I wrote down, I was feeling tempted, like something was tempting. I wrote down tempted by fate. And then I was somewhere, okay, so I'd written down like I felt like I was on a highway and I wrote down a mile marker. Well, I was um, in this part of the data, I was sensing a fog and a mist. I wrote down nighttime in a car. On the highway or an interstate is what I wrote down. Okay. And then, then uh, I actually was feeling, okay, so I wrote down hitchhiker. I actually wrote down hitchhiker. And then my sensory data was lonely and alone. Okay. So somebody was lonely and alone. And I, I actually wrote down the, the phrase solo dolo. <laughs> okay. So I was getting a whole lot of hitchhiker in, uh, data. I, I wrote down truck stop. So I don't know if there's a truck stop that he may have passed or if that's even a part of it, but I was picking up on an actual truck and a vehicle. So I wrote down in my tangibles, which was like, I was actually seeing it. I was sensing, I, I saw an actual truck. And then I heard last scene and then, and then it got super ominous because I wrote down attempted kidnapping, attempted murder. I wrote down uh, serial killer vibes snuffed out silenced and i and then at the very last the last bit of data i got was deafening silence and then i and then i ended the the session because i didn't feel like there was anything else that i could possibly get at that point from this um because i felt like someone had been unalived at the end of that target so that gets kind of into the theories of what actually happened at granger so let me kind of and i'd love to see your opinion based on what we know so in March, so he went missing in 1980 and most of his family. So in his will, he changed the word deceased to departed. He asked for no funeral because he wasn't, he's not going to be dead. When you say he was tempted by fate, I feel like Granger was so smart. He said that the aliens needed him. They needed his intelligence. And I feel like for him, this wasn't an egotistical thing. Like he saw other humans having relationships, having families. This was his fate. He wasn't going to have the wife and the kids, but he was going to go help the aliens, right, with their mechanics. So he goes missing. Now there's no evidence of him for six years. Then in March of 1986, news reports claim they found Granger's truck on Mount Prevo. As I had said, this is a mountain northwest of Duncan. At the top of the North Bluff is a war memorial. So, and I've said I wanted to cover this mountain because there's some weird shit around this mountain too. Mm -hmm. So the blast site with pieces of truck in a crater, workmen found it. They found a VIN number that was registered to Granger Taylor. Now the RCMP said that this truck was blue, not pink. I wrote down blue and pink in my data. That's so, so this is interesting. And so a lot of people have pushed back, but there was a journalist I listened to and I was researching and I thought he had a good point. Sometimes we have to look at the original color of the car because sometimes when the VIN number is registered, it's registered with its original color and not oh, and the color it is when it, and if it's a blast site, you might be not be able to recognize color anyway. All right. So this, and this was, now there's a lot of weirdness around this. Like the RCMP has been a little sketchy with this. And this, this leads to some of, of the circuit, the conspiracies around this. So the blast site was a 200 to 300 foot radius truck parts as far as 60 feet up. This is way too big for a normal blast site. Blast site. Many experts that are very well versed in dynamite say that this is not, this is the math ain't mathin', 
right? Like this is not adding up. So um, now here's the thing about dynamite. So Granger did work with dynamite as part of his job. Um, it, made, it makes sense. Like he was not a stranger to working. Now the thing about dynamite is that I didn't know this, but when you purchase it, it it's registered. They have to know who's purchasing it. And Robert, so so basically the theory was that he went up on the mountain and he unalived himself by setting his car right ablaze. But Robert, the little kid, went back to his workshop and found all of his, his dynamite was all accounted for. And there was no records of anybody, Granger, anybody matching Granger's description buying any more. And again, they, 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 they have to log this every time somebody bought in Canada, at least, at least in the 1980s. So they also found human remains and they found clothing that the RCMP, RCMP claimed a family member said was Granger's, but the family said they never asked them to ID the clothing. Oh my God. That's something that I, okay. I don't, I don't even think I said this. I think I skipped over it by accident, but I actually wrote in the tangibles. I wrote clothes. And yeah. that's where the that's where the bright colors came in too. Uh, was pink, green, blue, yellow, nineteen nineties, nineteen eighties colors. But it was clothes. So wow, interesting. Well, and Robert, the kid, brings this. Okay, so when we look at the human remains. They found two bone fragments, and they were determined to be human, but they could not DNA test them back in nineteen eighty. They don't even know if um, the DNA at the bones, the DNA was male or female. Now, 2024, they could. But guess what, you guys? Uh-oh. Oops. It's gone. Awesome. Awesome. Are you kidding me? Well, I mean, do people know where the site is? Could we, you go up there and kind of dig around for evidence today? Well, or? This site is also known, this mountain is known for planes to crash in this mountain and they're never found again. So the fact that people even found this is a miracle in itself. Oh. Um, and Robert was like, how the hell did a sweater, a wool sweater, survive <laughs> when the truck and the body didn't? I know. It's and like, never it's like was those contacted. Like those passports at 9-11, right? Exactly. Exactly. The family was never freaking suspicious. So, this, so, so again, the math ain't mathing on this. Like, you're telling me that the, that the biggest police force in Canada just, uh-oh, lost the bones of one of the most mysterious missing people cases in Canada? Hmm. And they never talked Maybe. to the family? They just told the family the case was closed. I think there's more to it because yeah, I, do too. I mean, especially with the data saying that uh, that there was. I mean, this is just data. Okay, so data where I'm not sol solving any crimes here or whatever, but it is it is interesting when you look at the whole case. And then I'm picking up on some kind of like he potentially had someone with him at some point. Um, I was picking up on he got snuffed out. That's unalived. That's I, not like him doing it himself. That's somebody else doing it to him. That's another theory that the government took him out. Well, there was an attempted kidnapping, I do believe. I mean, that was in the data. If if this, you know, and I, and I wrote down silenced, like he was silenced. He didn't silence himself. He was silenced. And that was one of the theories. So, you know, of course, the main theory is, was he picked up by a UFO and did they just discard the truck? Like, that was my, my boyfriend's first we were listening to. And he was like, did they pick him up? And then the, the craft was like, zap with the truck. Like, we don't need this. Like, threw it out the car and zapped it. Like, you know, but then there's also what, what we know about the government and their interference with thoughts. Was the government messing with his thoughts because there was something that he had discovered unbeknownst to him that was a threat to their power. I don't know. I don't know either. I, don't know. I, I didn't pick up any kind of data like that, though. I, I did pick up on... But okay, so this... The, in the According to the data, that's all I've got right here. Uh, to me, it looked as though he, he made a pit stop and he picked somebody up. And that's... And, and maybe that... I mean, who knows who that person was? And, uh, and something happened from there. That's, that's what I picked up was that there was someone else involved. 
and uh, and he was silenced. He was he was unalive by somebody else. But that, but then that would we got be the whole up. I would like to know because it's been forty four years, you guys. So if you're from the Canadian area and you're familiar with this case or this family. I would love to know, because that's not information anybody has ever shared before. Do you know if he was seen at a truck stop? Do you know? He was a very kind guy. They called him the gentle giant. So if somebody needed a ride, I'm sure he would have accommodated. You know, he he reconstructed a train and the neighborhood kids would come over to his house to ride the train back and forth across the backyard. I mean, this is a guy that people trusted. You know, and he and there was no 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 reason for them not to. So, um, so your opinion, Jessica, is he's probably not in the galaxy. Uh -uh. Not according to the data. Yeah, according to the data, he he has he's passed on to another realm. Okay, you know, and when when you're saying that that he was saying that he wanted to uh, he had a job to do with uh, the ETs or whatever was going on. I mean. I'm thinking on the terms of like interdimensionally and stuff and like maybe leaving this body behind and going into an interdimensional realm, you know, uh, into the next. Do you think he was aware of that? Or do you maybe. Think he knew he was that, that, was vibe, that was the vibe I was getting as you were talking about that. Yeah, I mean, maybe maybe it was just like, what is that cult? Okay, that um, they all wore the Nikes and they Heaven's drank the Coke. Heaven's Gates. Yeah. Gates. Maybe it was around the yeah. same time, right? Oh, God, oh, could have been. Could have been. So yeah. he was willing to lose his life and his body to go for the good for the good of outer space for ETs. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's wild. Yeah, I didn't even consider that. So that could also explain like the heartache and the heartbreak that he was not only leaving his dog and his family and his friends behind, but he was also leaving this Earth behind in general. His meat suit. <laughs> Yeah, maybe. It's an it's a I'm throwing a wrench in the engine, okay? But that may have an impossibility, not. you know, that's mm -hmm. why not? Yeah. Do you think the person he picked up had anything to do with his departure? Like was that an extraterrestrial he picked up who had incarnated <laughs> shapeshifted into this existence? Oh my god. I don't know. That's going out on a limb. I mean, it, anything's possible, but no. I don't know. I think it was I, it, it, to me, according to the data, it looked as though it was just a, somebody that had bad intentions is what it looked like for the data. But in my personal opinion, I don't know. I mean, that's is this is a wild case. It's so so freaking wild, man. I don't know. You know, yeah. I, I watch these like Insta stories and TikToks about like, you know how on Dateline and all these like true crime, they're like, she lit up a room when she walked into a, a door and people are like, if something happens to me, don't lie. Just be like, she had two friends. She wasn't everyone's cup of tea. Like, be honest. And I think that's what's so, so sensitive about Granger is Granger, like literally everybody, no one had anything bad to say about him. He was such a kind person. You know, he literally was that dateline. He lit up the room, you know, like when, it, you know, and so I think that's what's so heartbreaking. And he was, and I hate to use the term idiot savant. And that might be where the common sense factor goes out the window. Because sometimes people can be so smart that they lose common sense. And that could have been part of his demise was just not having the common sense, you know, to, to stay. Did you pick up anything about the weather? Mm, let's see. Fo yes, I wrote down foggy and mist. That was my called it. That night was the storm of the century. Okay. Yeah, I, I picked up nighttime in a car. Yep. On a highway or an interstate. I couldn't figure out. I, I wrote down both because I wasn't sure. I, was, I, was, I wrote down highway, interstate, and there was a foggy mist. I would love to know if there's anybody watching from Vancouver Island or who is familiar with Vancouver Island. Because Jessica and I, we're two Southern girls. <laughs> we're from the South. So we don't know much about the Pacific Northwest. So if, if you're familiar with Vancouver Island, can you kind of in the comment section or in the chat, give us your impression of this and like the mile marker and what... On Vancouver Island, is it more of a highway or is it more of an interstate? Like, what is that? 
like on Vancouver Island? Because when I think of islands down here in the south, I think of hot ass beaches, sand, swamp ass, boob sweat. <laughs> Yeah, but I don't know if the North, Northwest, it's a very different story. So um, so let us know, because I think that's very interesting, too, to have someone's perspective who's from that area. Um, because I, I still feel like, Jessica, today, it seems like there's a mixed a mixed opinion over what... I think some people really do think he's coming back for their grandchildren's grandchildren or something, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, I just... Okay, so last night I, on Space Out Radio, this over the weekend on Space Out Radio, uh, I have a show on... Um, on Sunday nights here. And I had a guest from the Catskill mountains <clears throat> over the weekend. And uh, his name's Charles Andrews. He's, he's a Bigfoot field researcher and he lives right across from me. You can see the mountain from his house. It's like a mountain. I think it's called Rip mountain or something like that, but it's, it's what the story of Rip Van Winkle was based off of. So this is so timely that we're talking about this right now because the story behind Rip Van Winkle goes, and that's in the Catskill mountains in New York. Okay, um, the this this guy was irritated with his wife. Okay, she was she was nagging him all the time. That's how the story goes, and uh, and so he he took his dog. This is this is, this is like a real real life Rip Van Winkle almost because he took his dog uh, up to the mountains to go get some fresh air, and uh, and he met a gentleman along the way who was carrying a keg of alcohol had some kind of substance in it and but but this difference is there was they were met he was helping this guy carry this keg up the mountain and there were all these like gnomes okay because the cat the cat skills right there are known for their gnomes they're little people and uh and the guy this is before the american revolution happened he took the keg up there they drank that night he drank a lot i guess and he passed out and when he woke up the next day he had a long beard down to his down to the ground and um, everybody was gone. His dog was gone. He stumbled into town. It was like, whoa, that was a weird night. It was 70 years later. And uh, and the whole town had changed. He was proclaiming, um, you know, his loyalty to the crown. And everybody was like, screw you. We're Americans now, <laughs> you know. And uh, and so, yeah, it's just it's a really interesting story. But he he wandered back down. He had been asleep on that mountain for 70 years or he just disappeared, actually, because I think I'm sure they went looking for him. Do you think that there is some folklore there that connects to the Granger story? Like maybe that was the Granger Taylor story of that time? Maybe could be. I mean, there's a reason that I talked about it on my show this weekend. I, I, I did my research on Rip Van Winkle. I didn't even know who Rip Van Winkle was. I had heard his name, but. Yeah. Interesting. We are great. It's so fascinating. Like it is so people are so torn on this. And so I think consensus is though he's probably not coming back. No. He might reincarnate. Yeah. Who knows? With memory yeah. of of being Granger. Because mm -hmm. he's never had a funeral. The state, I believe the state or the country has declared him legally dead. I think they have to do that in order to access his money for his provisions for his dog. But they've had no funeral because he didn't want a funeral because, you know, he was going to be sailing across the galaxy and helping the aliens with their with their stuff. So I'm going to pose to our audience, Jessica, I love doing these missing person cases and these like mis unsolved, I will call them the unsolved mysteries because some of them are paranormal. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna, if you are, if you're down for it, Jessica, if you have a case, an interesting, weird case from wherever you are in the world that you want me to look into, email me esotericatlanta at gmail.com and just put Jessica in the subject. I will research it and then I'll create coordinates for Jessica. Are you down for that, Jessica? I'm totally down. Yeah, that sounds fun. As long, try not to make it too gory if you can, y'all. Yeah. Okay. But it does, it is something. But, well, I really do like the um, the missing persons cases. That's why I do that. I, do, I love doing missing persons cases. Unfortunately, most of the missing persons are not alive. Okay. That I, that I end up looking for. But uh, but still, it's it's it gives some closure you know, to to people who don't have answers when their families go, you know, family members go missing and things like that. If it, it, anything I can do to help, you know, uh, I've been trained to do it. Why not? You know? Yeah. And I think it's Occam's razor too. You know, I think mm -hmm. sometimes when people go missing, we, we, we want, we have the human, the humanity in us wants to create these stories that they're alive and they're doing well. 
But Occam's razor typically is the most likely outcome is probably the outcome of, of what of what happened to these people. But yeah, let's do it. Let's some um, send guys send me any cases because I really enjoy this as well. It's um and I think that's humanity helping humanity. And mm -hmm. um do you think the government had anything to do with it, Jessica? I did not pick up on any government interaction with this. And trust me, most of my targets are government cover ups. <laughs> Okay, so uh, and I, I normally would pick up on something like that. I did not pick up on any kind of government, um, any government interaction on this one. Do you think he was really hearing extraterrestrials or do you think he was hearing his own voices? Uh, there's I don't know. I mean, look, coming from a girl who's had up close and personal contact with ETs, he may have been communicating with the ETs. They may have. They may have taken him. Yeah. You know, they, they could yeah. have taken him. Uh, yeah, he's, he's gone, but they, yeah, left his meat suit here, I think. Do you know, yeah. it's interesting, the Cassiopeians that we follow, they warn people not to get on spaceships for this very reason, too. And they also say, too, that just because we think of things like shape-shifting with, like, the reptilians or whatever, remember, they don't just shape-ship into people or humanoids. They can shape-shift into objects as well. And they say that if you get on a spaceship, chances are you're not getting off. Mm -hmm. And that's just another good, another good, another good point. You know, we're here on Earth. We're here Earth's Earthlings. This is our home for this life. You know, so that's a cautionary tale. And I think sometimes, though, Jessica, like I wonder, you know, the law of one talks about this concept of wishful thinking of being like a negative trait. And I think sometimes people confuse intuition with wishful thinking, but with Granger's situation, he seemed sad, you know, even though this was a trip of a lifetime, according to him and like maybe his destiny, he also, there was heartbreak, wasn't there to leave. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, definitely. I, I definitely picked up. I also picked up that he was very feeling ungrounded. Okay. That, I don't know if I mentioned that earlier, but that was part of my data. Uh, feeling very ungrounded, like a rebel, like he, he felt like he, like wild and free kind of, you know, like he, he's like a rebel soul ungrounded, but he was going with the flow. I clearly heard that clear audiently go with the flow is what I heard. So he was um, feeling so, discombobulated, but heard these voices. So he was going to go with the flow of what they were telling him to do. And maybe because he felt ungrounded, that's where he was seeking to be grounded again by following the advice of the voices he was hearing in his head. That's mm -hmm. why it's important to ground yourself, guys. Get grounded. That's right. That's a hard lesson to learn. So, well, I is there anything else about this case you want to say, Jessica? No, I think I think we covered all of the data here, and I think that uh, I think I don't know. I mean, I, I hope that you got some answers, maybe yes, from some of this. Great. And when you sent me you. you sent me the pictures of your of your remote viewing, I was like, shit, she got it. <laughs> She nailed it because you, you're like, I remember you're like, is this a missing person? I looked at yourself. I was like, oh, yeah, it is. And it looks like you kind of hit the nail on the head with this one. Yes. So now what's going on on your channel? What's coming up this week for you, Jessica, on your channel? Oh, man. Well, I, I just have shows this week. I've got a show Wednesday at 1 p.m. live on my channel, The Cryptid Huntress on YouTube. Uh, and I got another show on Thursday. I don't even know what my topics are yet. I, I'm such a last. I have I do so many shows and stuff, um, but it'll be a good one. And uh, and I'm at Spaced Out Radio this weekend uh, on Sunday as well. So, um, but yeah, other than that, I've, I'm going to be at the Georgia Bigfoot Conference. So I know uh, people on your channel, what, you got Esoteric Atlanta here. So we got some AT aliens yes, uh, watching yeah. And, uh, including myself okay and uh, the so the conference being held this year it's going to be up near clayton georgia uh it's actually at the dillard house in dillard i've been there i've been there i yeah. love that okay so we're going to be at dillard i believe it's march the 15th and through the 16th it's a two-day event um <clears throat> one of the biggest names in bigfooting ron moorhead is going to be speaking too so it's ron moorhead brooks agnew he's my friend uh, met him at the Journey to Truth conference. He is um, he speaks on inner earth and hollow earth theory. So that oh, he is. We've covered that on our channel. Right. Yeah, that's okay. fascinating. I highly recommend. Okay, uh, you guys come in to hear Ron Moorhead, Brooks Agnew, Matthew Delft, the badass monster hunter. He's going to be there. He's a good friend of mine, my research buddy, and myself. So the Cryptid Huntress. We're all going to be up there uh, along with some other people, some vendors food it's going to be awesome so um 
Y'all might even check my schedule and see what's going on that weekend. Because that sounds mm -hmm. like a blast. I've been to the Dillard house. Um, if you're in, if you're close, if you're in North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, Georgia mm -hmm. area, it's beautiful. That's where um, we go hiking all the time. Um, I know that's where you do a lot of your research, Jessica. It's a beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's where they shot Deliverance, parts of Deliverance. <laughs> Oh, okay. The banjo player was at the conference last year. Actually, really? I forgot his name. Yeah, the little kid. He's a, he's a, he's an older. He's a seasoned gentleman now. <laughs> but uh, but he was there signing autographs last year. Yeah. So go figure. You know, we got we it, every. It's so fun up there, and uh, yeah, it's full of. It's very squatchy. Okay. Yeah, lots and there's of, great restaurants. Of great if you're looking for a fun weekend, they've got downtown Clayton. They have like this great restaurant that they have a dog menu too. You can bring your dog and they have like a dog menu for the dog as well. So great antique shops. I think my friend Angie's up, she's up there a lot. She told me they have like a mystical shop up there now where you can get like yeah. crystals and your tarot cards and all sorts of fun stuff. So if you're close, I would highly recommend checking that out. You guys, Dillard House is it's right there it's like right beside clayton but clayton georgia if you can't say the dillard house because i know that might be quite pricey there's other hotels up in the That's area cheap, cheap motels around there oh my god Absolutely. we stayed in a cheap Forget motel him. last time we were up there we got a real cheap motel y'all and i was shocked like we pulled up to the outside and my boyfriend was like this is kind of sketchy but then we got into the room and i was like this kind of nice like it's not so bad for 60 bucks a night you know <laughs> we're not going to be here we're going to be out hiking so you know you just I, a shower in a bed yeah, right a shower that's in a bed that's all you need and um if you're from a city like <laughs> i am it's a dark night when you're up there isn't it i love it that's why i'm a cryptid researcher i'm a, I'm a bigfoot researcher i've been doing it for a long time so uh, i i've only stayed in a motel or a hotel whatever you want. i i'm gonna say that was a motel that i stayed in um but i've only stayed in one 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 time because i'm usually camping up there uh whenever yeah. we go or, or i'm at my one of my best friends they have a house at lake burton so i've stayed there several times too but um i'll couple tell times. a real funny story before before we head out do you remember jessica when we had the blizzard of 1993 oh god well, i was in high school so i don't know I, i'm i think i do yeah i'm sure <laughs> i remember it was up to my knee in 93 i was 11. And i remember so you guys the yankees can laugh at us <laughs> Anytime it snows down here, the Piggly Wiggly sells out of bread and water and milk. Everyone thinks Jesus is coming back if there's a little bit of snow. If we get a lot of snow, all hell breaks loose. We lose power. We don't have the equipment to clear the roads. So in 1993, we got hit with a blizzard out of nowhere. I mean, I remember the week before my dad mentioning that it was supposed to snow, but we were like in shorts and a t-shirt. And we were like, it's not going to snow, you know, but it snowed. It knocked out our power. And where we lived, we they couldn't get all the power lines were down. So we couldn't even as kids go outside and play because it was too dangerous to go outside and play. It was miserable. We had to pull a mattress into the living room to light a fire. We had to like bundle up. So we lived that way for a week. After a week, we still didn't have power. We lost water. So my parents had to figure out a way to get us into the town to get to try to get a hotel room. They called around. All these hotel rooms were booked up because the hotel rooms already had power back. So they finally find a hotel, a motel at the Rome Motel. Oh, God. Your Martha Berry Square Mall. Okay. And I'm 11 years old, so I know nothing about the ladies of the night at this point. We get there. It's, I remember thinking this is like a really like dirty, like I, but at least they had a TV and like a shower and like warm heat. heat. So my mother gets my sister and me into the bathroom. I'm sure we were getting put in the bath together at this time because we were probably so stinky and dirty. All of a sudden my mother screams and she goes, girls get in the living room. So we run into the living room, get dressed, get in the car. We get dressed, we get in the car, we're in my dad's car. And my mom go, goes, there was a, Mom, I'm, my mom's talking to my dad about there being a peephole in the bathroom. Because <gasps> it was one of those pay-by-the-hour hotels. Oh, my God. So my parents, in thank room. God, found a room at, like, the Holiday Inn. One room that my mom, my dad, my sister, me, my grandmother, my grandfather all shared together. 
I didn't care because there was an inside pool we could go swimming. I just thought it was great we had a pool. But I'll never forget that. And, and I guess it stood out in my head because I didn't know what a pee pole was, nor did I know what a pay-by-the-hour motel was. My mother was, like, yelling at my dad. Like, he basically brought us to a brothel to get a room at a motel. And there was a pee pole, which, of course, your two girls are in there taking a bath. Of course, you're going to scream for them to get out. But, yeah, that that's my motel experience from the Rome Motel in 1993. Oh my gosh. Well, you have you have memories of a lifetime then for that. Yeah, so. I love a freaking lifetime. I is so scandalous. I think my mother was probably mortified that her daughters and she just kept talking about that people, that people. I was oh, like, I'd be furious. I would be so mad cuz I have a kid. If yeah. oh no. Mm -mm. And I'm thinking like what yeah. people? <laughs> I just thought it was kind of dirty hotel. I didn't realize that it was a pay by the hour hotel. <laughs> you know, a family Ew. of four young children. Don't touch anything. Don't I know, touch anything. Right? <laughs> but I had so much fun. Once we got to the Holiday Inn, we stayed there for about a week until we got water and electricity back in our house. But I had so much fun because, of course, school was canceled. And we, we were, our grandparents were in the room, too. And, of course, when your grandparents are there, you get spoiled with everything. We could swim in the indoor pool. And we got to have, like, pancakes for breakfast every morning at the buffet. At the, I thought it was great as a kid, you know. Then I think about my mom having to stay in a small hotel room with her in-laws. I'm like, what's worse, the pay-by-the-hour hotel or staying in a hotel room with your in-laws for a week? <laughs> <You know? laughs> <laughs> so oh God. the place I stayed up in Clayton is not, that's not, it was an actual hotel where you paid for the night. <laughs> not, the hour. not the hour, y'all. Not the same thing. Not the hour. The Rome Motel. I'd rather stay in my tent, man. I, I'll stay in my tent and swim in the, I'll, I'll wash off in the creek. Okay. <laughs> I'm a country girl. I can handle it. As long as it's not too cold. That sucks. We couldn't even play outside in the snow. And us Southerners don't get snow that often. So when we see it, we want to play in it. But the power lines were down, so we couldn't even go outside to play. We just had to, I mean, we read so many books by the fire. Thank God we were the generation that didn't have internet because we wouldn't have, we didn't have such a withdrawal. All we were missing was the TV, you know, so we could read, we could play with our Barbies, all that kind of stuff. So I remember we'd have to go pee, though, because we had, like, our snowsuits on from we go having to, like, pull your pants down and pee in that cold. Oh, that was brutal. I remember <laughs> that. I'm traumatized by that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my story you guys but i'm actually gonna once we hop off jessica i'm actually gonna talk to my boyfriend because i think it'd be so fun to go up there for the bigfoot conference he's a he's a lover of the of the cryptoids as well so you know y'all please come up there it's gonna be so fun and they have the best vendors with bigfoot merch and i got some jewelry last year i bought some bigfoot earrings and stuff so yeah it's it's just gonna be a good time i think some of my team's gonna be up there hanging out with us too Get to hang out with some Bigfoot field researchers if you come up there. Yeah, oh, y'all can see me. Yeah. Let us know in the comment section if you're planning on coming or if you live close by. I'm actually really going to look into it once we get off and, and talk. We've actually been talking. My boyfriend and I have been talking about planning a weekend to the mountains <laughs> again. So nice. you know, we might just make a long oh, weekend on. out of it and go hiking. Hiking that, the, on the, what I'm assuming the 15th is a Saturday, the 16th is a Sunday. Oh. It must be the 14th. I think it's Friday and Saturday. So it'll be the Friday and Saturday of that weekend. So then we, let me, let me look on my little schedule. Here. I don't even, I don't even have a calendar right here. I do. Actually, I do. It's right here in front of me. Here, I, have I can my tell you. Calendar. Uh, I'll tell you right now. Yeah. So the 15th is a Friday. The 16th is a Saturday. The 17th is St. Patrick's Day, Sunday. Okay, it's the 15th and 16th. The 15th, we're having a, a round table, I think, with the speakers and all the vendors will be there and stuff. And then the 16th is the big day for the, the full conference uh, with all the presenters and stuff will be on that Saturday. That's so, cool. yeah. so I'm going to definitely, because that's like in a couple of weeks, actually. I'm going to go talk to him and make sure and let's see. Cindy, if you're watching, I might need you to sub my class that Sunday. <laughs> so, yeah. So, all right, you guys. Well, I let me know if you guys are coming, too. Let's see. Maybe we can have, like, a little meetup. Oh, that'd be awesome. Get a beer together. Go find some Bigfoots together. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Beers and Bigfoots. I can do that. I can totally deal with that. 
<laughs> just make sure you're not staying in a pay pay by the hour hotel or motel. Wash, yeah, wash your people. Well, the only thing peeking around uh, me would be a bigfoot peeking around a tree. No peepholes. Yeah, no okay. peepholes. We don't want peepholes <laughs> unless you're into that kind of thing and you're a consenting adult. Otherwise, no people. So <laughs> don't tell us. We don't need to hear that. <laughs> we don't need to know about. It. We don't know about it. All right, you guys. Well, thank you so much for doing this, Jessica. I can't wait to do the next one with you. I know I talked to Derek. We want to do an episode about the land between the lakes in. Uh, was that Kentucky, Tennessee area? Yes. We'll yeah, Kentucky and Tennessee. That. Yeah, we'll uh -huh. keep you posted on that. So thank you so okay. much, Jessica. Make sure you're subscribed to Jessica, guys. All that stuff will be down in the description box below. So make sure you're subscribed. Do us a solid. If you enjoyed this video, please give us a like. Please share this video because Jessica and I deal with the same type of... Um, they don't like us that much. The controllers don't like us that much. So, <laughs> so <laughs> help us out, you guys. Thank you so much again sitting through this video. We appreciate it. Cannot wait to hear all of your opinions. And we will talk to you guys soon. Bye, everybody.